Hi, Mike. Where are you checking in from today? So I'm in Brighton at the minute, Brighton, England. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Brighton. I don't know too much about it. It's great. It's um, so it's about an hour from London. It's yes. right on the on the south coast of England. So yeah. it's always raining. It's always windy. Yeah. But it's a very cool kind of hit place. I get. It's almost like the San Francisco of England. I would say. We yeah. kind of. And it's known for the it's known for the Brighton beaches too. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And isn't there a famous pier there? Brighton Pier. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty famous. It's a good, it's a good, good music scene. Yeah, it's a great, great place to be. So talking about the music scene and COVID-19, I mean, we pay a lot of attention to what's going on locally, but how's everything playing out there? Yeah, it's, um, so we've obviously, we've, we've come out of lockdown for, a, it's been about nearly two months now. Things are still slow, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, things have gone back to a fairly normal life, um, but still, it's sort of a bit of a halfway house, to be honest. Yeah, it's pretty much the same way here. We uh, entered into something called stage three a few months ago. And with a few restrictions, pretty much everything is open. But right now, we are experiencing a major surge, which is quite worrisome. And I understand you're kind of going through the same cycle right now? Yeah, that would be correct. Your thoughts on the, uh, your government's response, not to get political, but because there's no playbook, obviously everybody's trying to do the best they can, but you have some feelings? It's difficult because I feel, it, it feels very confused about how the virus is spreading and what it's doing. Mm -hmm. And how, and how it, and it seems like the enemy that's being fought, um, it's difficult to fight something when you don't know fully how to do that or, or exactly what it is. Right. So it's diff it's easy to kind of criticize in hindsight. Th mm -hmm. Some of the some of the instructions have been very vague, and they mm -hmm. keep changing their slogan. Mm -hmm. um, the new one is kind of "Stay Alert," you know, which is kind of funny because it's a it's a virus. So I don't know how you sort of stay alert as if it's some sort right. of predator that's going to jump out of a bush and attack you. Yeah, we um, have to uh, acquire some new skills, eh? So I, I feel like. Some of the language being used is sort of not that helpful and the message is a bit confusing. Is there a faction of denial over there? There's a bit of that over here. Hoax, uh, it's just the flu, that kind of word speak. Is there any of that existing over there? That ex definitely exists over here. It's definitely mm -hmm. not the, it's definitely a minority though. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it seems more paranoia than people, that, sort of harmless paranoia, the people that really are acting upon that, the people mm -hmm. that seem to have that sort of entrenched view on it seem to be a minority to me. Yeah, so let's talk about how it affects you and your industry at large and how you've used this either as an opportunity or as well, clearly you've used it as an opportunity to create some new music. And how are you leveraging this new music to make an opportunity out of the the times that we're in? Well, I'm a big believer in boredom. I think there's <laughs> I think there's something really powerful about boredom. And I I grew up always complaining I was bored. You know, I was always complaining there's nothing to do. I, I grew up in a you know a fairly sleepy seaside town, but out of boredom is kind of how I found music really. It was something that was free and something that I could do to make my own fun. And that's really what got me creative. And I have a theory that if I was brought up somewhere like California or somewhere, or somewhere where there was a more of an outdoor life and more things to do and more things to go and see, I don't think I'd be as creative as I am. So I think, so boredom is something I, I really believe in and I think is a big part of the reason I started playing music in the first place. Um, and so when lockdown hit over here, that same thing came to get me because, you know, I'm, you know, this is our third record, I've made a lot of music and I've written a lot of songs. Um, and part of that is because I want to make a great record, obviously, and I want to validate myself um, through creativity. But when lockdown hit, it was a different type of creativity because suddenly it was this um, forced situation to be stay in and stay at home, which was fine. 
But after a week, I was like, man, I need to do something. I need to, um, yeah, fill this void, you know. And I don't drink anymore. I don't do any recreational drugs anymore. So I was like, mm. I really have nothing to do. So I found music, again, was the answer to that. And I'm lucky enough to have a small studio near where I live. But I have key to, and I just was went in there on my own. And... Um, it was, yeah, it was so creative because it was, I didn't necessarily make it with my own band in mind. It was just, I'm going to go in there and make whatever I want to make and kind of um, feel completely unshackled by any limitation or anything. So it was just mu making music for the sake, just for the sake of making it. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, I think made some of the best music that we've ever made. And, Two of the songs, two of the songs out of that situation are going to be singles, um, and they're my favourite songs on on the record. So, from a creative and musical standpoint, yeah, I feel like I made lemonade. Good for you. Now, judging from what you said a couple of minutes ago, you seem to be a believer that environment shapes interests and character rather than a perhaps a genetic disposition. Definitely, definitely. I um, I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, and mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of pointed that out for me and reinforced that idea that yeah, it's it's a lot to do with kind of my upbringing and you know, and all sorts of privileges that allowed me to be as creative as I I got to be early on in life, you know. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in environment. Also, as well, I would say one thing that's really been an influence over my music without me really knowing is, is the kind of weather here because it's so, we have a lot of weather and it's so dramatic. Mm -hmm. And quite often, you know, I think what's going on in your own mind is we often use kind of weather metaphors to kind mm -hmm. of um, explain it. And I, a lot of these new songs, you're, which aren't released yet, I, re I only realized recently that, oh my goodness, that's massively to do with being by the sea that's just roaring in front of you and having these kind of dramatic winds. And um, yes, yeah, Brighton's a very epic place to live. Yeah, there's a funny, uh, there's a funny saying about weather for people in New England. Uh, they ask, what's today going to be like? And the answer is always, give us 10 minutes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So speaking of uh, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, do you uh, do you think you could uh, trace back to when you hit your ten thousand hours? Good question. Um, it's so hard to um, quantify like how much time I've put in, but I, yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, it's got to be over ten thousand hours. Um, yeah, music's the only thing I can really think where I put like. It's difficult because I also I'm not sort of counting them because I'm doing it all the time. I just feels like as soon as I've really found music, it's just been as natural as breathing, as cheesy as that sounds. I've just mm -hmm. it's something I or I go to bed thinking of a song and I wake up listening to voice notes or reading notes with lyrics. I'm always it's something I just live with, you know doesn't sound like you pressure yourself at all it comes to you quite naturally yeah it's just a, i've just learned that it's just a, it's just a part of who i am it's not all of who i am but it's a big part of who i am yeah yeah do you remember the first time that you realized you loved music was there something you heard was there a moment was it the radio was it seeing a live band was it a song your mother used to sing it was the first the, my first real yeah moment I guess where I was just completely taken by it I, was, I must have been seven and mm -hmm. I was in primary school obviously and the teacher my teacher Miss Sel Barnes she played Penny Lane to the class and it was like magic I just never I'd, I'd never it's my early earliest memory of music um she played Penny Lane and she also played Nimrod in versions by Elgar, which is an amazing piece of music. And though it was so, these two different, completely different worlds and I was, I saw them both the same, even though they're completely different types of music. I was just, I got the same feeling. It was, this, I was taking the same drug. Yeah. Um, 
so yeah, that's my kind of earliest. And then I would say the second time is when I, I bought um, a Queen record for the first time. Which um, one was it? It was just it was just the greatest hits, but it was like a triple a triple disc thing that I'd saved up for. And I just I don't I'd only heard a snippet of Queen on Wayne's World, and that was my only real reference. Ah. <laughs> and I went to go and I went to go and buy the greatest hits, and it's like my I me, I remember how like the CD like smelt. I remember like smelling it and then like putting it in the CD player, and Bohemian Rhapsody in the first track, and it was just like, yeah, it was just. Oh, yeah, it's just the most amazing feeling in the world. And, and that, I kind of knew, oh my goodness, this, I have to be a part of this. You know, I have to, I have to join this kind of tapestry. <laughs> what kind of music program or what kind of music learning was there in, in your primary school system? There was, you know, you, you could get sort of lessons after school, I guess. And, and music, music class was from memory just sort of, kids going through the percussion boxes and ever would just be like a complete racket. Mm -hmm. So um, it wasn't really part of curriculum or anything like that? Not massively, no, no. Yeah. It was, it was usually the class that everyone, it was when you could actually take a break and not do anything. But I found, I found myself sort of at lunchtime and a break at school in the music room playing the piano. That's kind of, that's all I did. I didn't go and play some football or whatever. Are you still playing piano? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so you... the majority of this record, I've written all the lyrics sat at the piano mm -hmm. as a way. I always, it's just, that's kind of home for me and that's kind of how I get my head around the song. Um, mm -hmm. And it sounds like you uh, wrote most of the <laughs> new material without Ben. When do you, when do you bring him in or does he uh, tag along for the writing sessions? Uh, a mixture of everything, really. Yeah. Um, obviously, lockdown was a bit more difficult, but um, yeah, kind of every combination. I mean, in some of the songs we were kind of sat together and working on, and others were kind of he was working from home and I was working from home and bringing stuff together. Um, but what's great is that Ben he plays drums like a songwriter, and he he's he's thinking of what benefits the song the most and. He's not thinking from a drummer's perspective, which is really useful, you know, because I think that's the thing that we both share is that we, the song is the most important thing. Um, whatever we need to do to make it better is what we're going to do, if that, if that makes sense. I think sometimes, I think sometimes as a musician, you can, there's an insecurity to overplay or, or, or play something impressive because that's what you feel like you should do. Whereas, we're all about like, if playing the simplest thing is the best thing, then that's what we're going to do. It almost like it, it takes more courage and more balls to do less. Yeah, it does. And especially when you're a group of two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, Trouble's Coming, the new single. Um, it sounds very much like Royal Blood, but it's a lot dancier. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fair enough um, review. Yeah. And how does, and the flavor on the rest of the record similar? Yeah, I think that that song we kind of felt like we hit upon something that felt new but didn't feel uncomfortable because I think I think sometimes people can fall in the trappings of you have to feel it has to feel uncomfortable, you know. Whereas mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. To, yeah. Us, yeah, to us it was important to not do anything out of our comfort zone but to do something that we just hadn't done yet, you know? And this way of playing music for us was like, it was always in us. It just, I don't think it had ever been fully revealed or fully kind of acknowledged. So yeah, everything was a bit more danceable. And, um, you know, the way Ben's kind of playing these beats, these kind of like disco beats, but they're not light. They're kind of very alpha and very heavy. Uh, and it, it almost meant that I could play even heavier riffs, but they would sort of, that the target would go from your eyes to your hips, you know? Mm. Mm. And then suddenly they became, yeah, they became dance songs with very little effort, to be honest with you. We only had to do a few 
twists and suddenly it was yeah I think that's part of being in a two-piece as well that everything's so extreme that it only takes a very minor shift for something to seem quite dramatically different and that's that's what I enjoy about having minimal components I've been getting the wrap-up sign for a little while it's too bad because we're just getting warmed up so when you're in Toronto next time and hopefully hopefully it's sooner than later maybe we can have a little bit of hang time yeah, I'd love that, man. Yeah, great to chat with you. Always, Mike. All the best to you. Take care, man. See ya. Bye. Cheers.